So thank you everybody for joining uh, today. We're really excited to host our guests today. Uh, they are joining us all the way from Cape Town via uh, Harvard GSD. Um, Heinrich and Ilse Wolf are architects who work in Cape Town. Uh, their practice is developing architecture of consequence, which I, I always love this description, uh, through through the design, advocacy, research, documentation, and art, informed by history of their home in Cape Town, they established their architectural practice as a vehicle for addressing social inequities and the erasure of indigenous uh, landscapes and narratives. Um, Heinrich's um, 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 practice spans uh, uh, many years, but uh, most recently he has been teaching uh, at Harvard GSD together with Ilse, uh, and, and, and I will add some sort of uh, personal notes for us personally uh, has been one of the maybe most influential practices for many reasons. One, because uh, they're friends. Another one is because uh, um, I've seen Ilse present when I was really young and I, I was uh, kind of shocked. <laughs> Just like 30 second presentation and I was like, this is the first time I hear in such, a, in, such, in such an environment somebody deliver something that has so much resonance, that resonates so strongly with the ways we, th we think about, not even architecture, about the, about the world, about the environment. Uh, um, uh, and, and ever since then, and I'm not going to read the, the bio so much because I, I think it's written everywhere and you've seen it, but it's been a way to understand how architecture can be used to address many of the questions that are urgent and fundamental for us to understand the world in which we live, how do we relate to each other, and how architecture or the lack thereof mediates those interactions, right? How architecture makes it easy or difficult, right? How, how landscape, how representation are also vehicles not only to show but also to erase, and I think that that's something that is really central. I have to say that in a, in a personal note, I attend to all the lectures of them that I can as an as audience, right? Uh, because I, it's like every time I learn something, I, I love also hearing Heinrich dismantle the masters of the Bauhaus in public, which is something that I, I am very passionate about. So it's really incredible like, hearing like taking down the theories of, of laws of, about ornament and all these things. I, I'm always like, wow, this is a great way to put it, uh, which also contributes to our own way of thinking about architecture and even teaching. So many of the things in a way like this semester, as we, the, the lectures committee that we are lucky to be a part of, is organizing the lectures. We've been thinking about how do, do architects and thinkers and philosophers engage with the construction of modernities and questions of modernities. And I feel like your practice in a way encompasses in many different ways the really violent legacies of modernities we are fighting against, but also other modernities that have always existed and that have been in place. Uh, and we are really excited and looking forward to this, uh, and hopefully students can also engage with, with, with questions later. Uh, so without further introduction, we have today Ways of War Making with Ilse and Heinrich Wolf. Thank you very much. Um, uh, seeing that you are generally a younger generation, I could urge you to do two things at the same time. Is we're going to give a lecture uh, about how we work. Uh, you can, if you want, look at our website and look at our work. So we're not so much going to talk about the work per se. We're going to talk about how do we get to the work. So if you want to go www.wolfarchitects.com co.za, you can go and have a look under the project section, you can look at some of the public and residential projects and so on, you can ask us questions about that, you're welcome to do so. I would not take you as being distracted, I would take you as being multitasking. But the presentation today is trying to speculate with you, to think through with you, how do we get to uh, what we get to and why are we pursuing what we are pursuing. So what's so wrong about what the Bauhaus masters did? 
they did such beautiful buildings, why, why do we see ourselves uh, in other ways today? What is it that happened that puts us at odds with those histories, makes us just compelled to think and work differently? And we'll try and focus on that. Okay. So as a general introduction, I can just say that an immersive and a situated practice of architecture demands a confrontation with the actuality of the world around us. We want to see the world just for what it is, not for what it should be or what other people hoped it would be, but we are very keen to see the world just for what it is. Uh, today, Ilza and I uh, aim to describe uh, how the practice of doubling projects up of multiple outcomes, of sowing confusion, um, of repetitive investigations, simulation exercises, uh, and working through the relationship between fragments and the whole, and methods of working aimed at being responsible while pushing the boundaries of architecture is part of the way we're working. We'll go through that. It's a summary of the headings. Considering the urgent need for social, political, and economic change in South Africa, architects have to find ways to accelerate the generative reciprocities between reflection and action in their work. So in other words, these working methods are not just how we work as practitioners or theorists and writers and so on, but it's also about how do we do it faster, you know? Imagine you think of your life as being extremely short and having to do something of consequence um, and society moving and you wanting to move with that. Okay. Um, reflecting on one's working methods uh, reveals one obvious contradiction and that is the tension between a habit, that which we regularly do, and the practice of disruption. There's this heroic sense of the architect as this constant disruptor. But of course, you might want to go to work every morning at 8, which is not a process of constant disruption. You don't just rock up any time, eat anything, do anything, behave in any way. You have certain working habits. Now, if you have working habits, and you start getting on in life like I do, um, you repeat those habits. So where does disruption fit into that? Uh, and I think that is what we're trying to do, because the true revolutions may be bred one day while sitting on a chair. How do we do that? OK, so in our discussion today, we will reflect on our working method and the mutually generative relationship between design, writing, making, teaching, and advocacy. Um, we will try and illustrate how we practice socially and responsibly by developing ways of being in the world, describing it, collecting, breaking it apart, reassembling it, repairing, and finding ways of taking real risks. We will also reflect on how we practice the production of knowledge and artifacts. So when I refer here to practicing here, um, I'm not referring so much to being in the business of architecture. I'm talking about practice as repetition, like a gymnast would repeat things, or like a drill, like a, a pilot in a flight simulator. So we are practicing this thing. It's as if it's extremely difficult, we've got to do it over and over in preparation of the real thing. So a lot of what we're doing is to practice for something else. Preparatory exercises where we practice our architecture are reciprocal forms of learning and acting. Practicing is a working method that accelerates one's confrontation with the consequences of your thoughts and your actions. Teaching, reading, writing, designing, making, and advocacy are all methods uh, which accelerate these confrontations. So part of why we have these multiple outputs is because we believe we need to accelerate our engagement with the world, with our thoughts, and with the consequences of our thoughts. 
Um, I can just say is that this, this book that was off, uh, recently edited by Miguel Guitard from Buffalo University, a whole lot of fantastic essays to which we contributed one on our working methods. It's more extensive than what we'll be talking about today. On my side, I'm not sure. Is this on? I don't think so. Is this on now? Can you, can you hear me now? Can everybody hear me? <laughs> okay, so from my side, I'm also thrilled to be here um, and um, sharing the not exactly our projects, but uh, the way that we, that we work, because I think it's very important as a pedagogical communication, you know, of how we actually get to, to where, we, where we are. One of the things that we love doing is to think of any project that comes into our office as a as a as a project of dual thinking of double of a double project, right? So, for instance, in this book that we um, that I wrote around a factory in um, Salt River, um, the commission or the ask was to write a um, heritage statement or a heritage study of a modernist building. In fact, um, I actually pursued this project because this is a building that really haunted my imagination and I heard that there was a commission to study it. So we took on this commission for a kind of a study of this building in order for developers to develop a, an argument to, to refurbish it. But then it became another project for us. It became this project of thinking about race relations, the construction of personhood, the construction of gender, the construction of a particular kind of modernity in Cape Town that really became very personal to me because this is a kind of building, a garment factory, a garment um, ma uh, making factory that started in the 1930s and it was a factory that a lot of my ancestors and family members actually worked in. So I became interested in the kind of in individual um, process of understanding my own um, a connection with modernist architecture, but then be thinking, then also thinking about how it begins to structure the city that we live in. So this is a book that we eventually published um, and became kind of a core foundation of how we think about buildings and cities in South Africa. And you may want to order a copy for your library. Um, Unstitching Rex Trueform, the story of an African factory. But a more recent one that we got engaged in is about this, this house. And just allow me one minute. So this house is um, a cottage close to um, our office. It's 20 minutes drive and it's on the sea. But Bessie Head, a South African writer from um, Botswana, once described the owner of this house in this way. Let me just read what she said. The best way I can explain it is in the words of an industrial millionaire who used his money to conquer the interior of Southern Africa. His main area of conquest, and he waged two wars against the people, was Zimbabwe, which formerly had his name Rhodesia. When he waged the last war of conquest in 1896, he said, I have taken everything from them but the air. The problem is more acute in South Africa. You look across the land and as a black person, you feel choked. You feel like even the air has been taken because so many vast areas have been reserved for white occupation only. There's nothing there for black people. Bessie Head wrote, wrote this and spoke about this condition in a radio interview in 1984 that we tracked down. And Bessie Head is also a kind of a patron saint for our office, this writer. But Rhodes Cottage, the name of this project, is a modest but stately sea-facing property along False Bay in Cape Town. It is a house museum dedicated to the life of Cecil John Rhodes, the industrial millionaire that the South African writer Bessie Head speaks of in the opening epigraph of this, of this talk. Rhodes was a British mining magnate and politician in Southern Africa who served as Prime Minister of the Cape from 1890 to 1896. And the cottage once stood, this cottage once formed part of his large estate 
an estate that included the University of Cape Town, which is our alumnus, Grotteskir Manor, which is now the presidential house, and the public gardens called Kirstenbosch. And it's the most impressive garden in South Africa. So he acquired this holiday house in 1899 in Musenberg in an area which at the time consisted of a few farms and a number of fishing huts, which you see in the slides. And the timing of Rhodes' purchase of this house coincided with the South African War that unfolded between 1899 and 1902, in part as a consequence of the failed Jameson raid um, instigated by Rhodes and his compatriots in 1895. But during the war, Rhodes spent time in this cottage and, as, and he was soon followed by other mining magnates who also burnt, built extravagant sort of, you know, uh, colonial style villas. But despite owning other more expansive properties in Cape Town, he chose this humble cottage. I think you can. He chose this humble cottage to, um, to recover because of its access to fresh air. It was close to the Atlantic Ocean and he had a lifelong medical condition that affected his heart and lungs. He spent his final weeks in the front bedroom of the cottage with an oxygen cylinder by his bed and requested his aides to knock a hole in the wall of, this, of his bedroom opposite the window to allow a breeze to come through. So various details of the aftermath of his death, such as how the South African government obeyed his request for his remains to be transported by train from this house to the Matopo Hills in Zimbabwe, about 1,200 miles away, and stopping at every major city along the way for mourners to pay respect, and how since this railway line stopped short of that destination, it was actually extended by black Zimbabweans as the procession was underway. These are, not really con these are all contained in the house ex itself, but it's expressed in very triumphant terms, you know, sort of celebrating the man and celebrating his death. But neither of these, and neither these or any other details are framed to viewers as a critique of the violence that Rhodes represents. There's nowhere in the house um, you find, for instance, the song Sissel Rhodes, composed by Yuma Sekela, or, um, you know, the, any books by um, Dambuza Marashera, who wrote of the colonial consequences, um, um, you know, of, during Ian Smith's regime. You won't find these books in the house museum. Um, so, so, so they're largely missing in the house. It is as if the house is a stuffy, damp vault that, is, that sits outside, but simultaneously next to some of the most socially transformative uprising against the legacy of roads, such as the Roads Must Fall movement, which happened literally down the road from this cottage at the University of Western Cape and other South African um, universities. Um, so in, in mid-2021, last year, we were again commissioned to look at this house as a kind of a conservation project, right? Um, to think through what is the future of this building and how do we engage it for a public, um, a public offering in Cape Town? How do we think about, you know, its historical value? But knowing what we know about Rhodes and what Bessie Head wrote about him, we couldn't think of this house as a kind of a, a neutral landscape. So how do we go about that? When we got to the site in, um, last year in July, we found that the house was actually in very good condition, but there were three little structures on the site, and the one was a structure called the caretaker's cottage. There were many photographs sh that show the house as Rhodes founded, a dilapidated corrugated iron roof with an unruly stone wall and a wooden fencing, and then its transformation after his death into the neat thatch-roofed house we see today. So I've also found in the archives that, you know, um, this site said that the fisherman's cottage, um, the small part, the oldest part of the house was a fisherman's cottage. And other historical sources um, were more telling of the area's history. F foundations could, could be that this house was actually occupied by fishermen, by Filipino immigrants, and by other enslaved people 
um, in the area of which Musenberg has a rich history. So the caretaker's cottage becomes um, a key moment on the site, and one wonders why has this not been incorporated properly into, into, the, into the, the history of the site. There's a lot of emphasis on roads and the, and the kind of colonial conquest, and we thought that maybe, you know, as a way to reimagine this, this house is to open it up to a whole lot of history around, um, around that. So our report included a very technical study of this house, but it also included a call to reimagine this house as, as a more inclusive history. So we wrote the report, we handed it into the city of Cape Town, and everybody was very happy with it, and they all sort of you know, agreed this is the future. But we did get pushback from one uh, organization who is currently the owners or the custodians of this um, museum. Um, so I call them the Musenberg Hysterical Society, um, but they're actually the Historical Society, and they push back quite heavily um, against our report and um, also provided an 11-page critique of our report saying that it was ahistorical, that there's other slave museums down the road, um, and they also even said that our, our report was viciously anti-white um, in, in its kind of call to reimagine. And one of the most emotional things that they actually said is that because we included the history of indigenous people on the site and all of that, they actually said that, you know, the Khoi people, the indigenous people, were largely extirpated by smallpox by the middle of the 18th century and that their migration routes were lost to them. In sociological terms, they were displaced by a more powerful society. This is what people are writing to me six months ago about this house. Right, so that we shouldn't look at indigenous histories because, you know, um, because of white supremacy, actually. So it really took a knock around how this kind, these kinds of these kinds of structures. It doesn't look like a building that uh, means anything, actually. But once you begin to uncover it, once you begin to think of it as a, a project of potential kind of renewal or rec uh, conciliation, there is major pushback, not in, s in, the, in, ki in the kind of powerful terms, because the city was very adamant that we should have it, the historical society, the Heritage Western Cape was extremely open to it, but there was the current custodians that were extremely unhappy about what we had to say. So how do we turn this building to a space of breathing? Because the heritage of this project, we said, is actually that it was a space for roads to heal, to to breathe, in essence, you know, in a land where Bessie Head was saying that he's taken out all the air. So, in a way, our proposal to, to the custodians and to everybody about this project was to actually think of the space as a, a space for healing for everybody that has been, um, you know, oppressed by the legacies of Cecil John Rhodes and colonial her heritage, including potentially people that um, come from Zimbabwe, Zambia, South Africans, and they should be the primary occupiers of the space. So in February 2022 this year, the report was approved by heritage authorities, a success in that major decision makers believe in the revised ethic that the report proposes. The challenge still, the challenge still remains, however, as to how the space can become a, a marker for an emancipatory spatial practice, a space that breathes, breathes black peace, another um, kind of mantra that we got from Bessie Head in the way she describes her own house, rather than a space in which one feels compelled to knock holes in the walls in order to shift the energy and release the air that dampens the senses and perce perce perceptions. Rhodes bought this cottage and chose it as a space for him to heal from a debilitating respiratory condition. Today, the space continues to have the incredible potential for healing and to return it as a space for breathing. Its history as a public institution further increases this potential to enact healing on a societal and ecological scale. Project is still in process, but um, there were some small victories in place. Um, the other way that we work in the, um, in the, in the studio and in our, sp in our space is to think of all projects as having multiple outcomes. And in particular, this project, which um, centered around um, the legacy of Bessie Head, as we've, as we've spoken about before, 
But in this project, we you know, produced this collage and we produced um, a research project that began to collect plant material from the garden in Seroe in Botswana, where we went to look at the house um, and from various other gardens where the writer um, visited um, and also happened to be sites of forced removals. And this becomes a publication, uh, a letter exchange. It became a film. It recently became a vinyl pressing because the film soundtrack was on the on the vinyl with um, Bessie Head's voice also um, partaking in that. But essentially it also became a, a new way of looking at spatial practice because for us Bessie Head became this kind of person that practiced space and made space in communal ways um, and potentially this garden, this garden as a space of, of, of emancipation. Um, so there's a lot there's a lot in this project that I would urge you to look at if we had more time. But the multiple outcomes begins to re begins for us to rethink of our work as not just being bound to making buildings, but to, to think about buildings and to think about space through these various media. We also engage with um, a, um, a a friend of ours who is a playwright and who wrote a play about a site that was. Um, began to be excavated and we found that, the city found that underneath this excavation there were th these um, uh, graves of enslaved people from the um, early 18th century. And she wrote a play about this project and we then um, worked with her to, to develop the, the aesthetic of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the publication and of the, of the play with her. And then finally, the way we um, think about multiple outcomes is, is a design project, but before the design project, there's this kind of collage of making, um, making objects, making space, thinking about scale, thinking about various um, you know, curatorial practices and how the curatorial practice for a project like the African Mobilities Project in Munich becomes this kind of extension of, um, of, of the built form, but also how do we think about light, how do we think about um, furniture? How do we think about knowledge in, in different ways and making space? Um, project was curated by Mpo Matsipa, and um, you know it was it was an installation at the TU, TU Munich um, uh, University. And I'll just so show you some um, snippets of that project that began essentially as a kind of a playful way of making models with paper and then it ends up in this kind of space of, of conversation about the, af the, the, the contribution that spatial practice in Africa has on the world. Over to you, Heinrich. I don't need a microphone. Are you still, are we, are we all still engaged? <laughs> <laughs> she okay. needs a wake. Are you still, all still awake? <laughs> Um, the, the next uh, pursuit that Ilza and I are quite passionate about is this idea that new ways of knowing leads to new ways of seeing. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, as you may or may not know, Ilza and I uh, are partners in life and in work, um, and we right. work we're not supposed to give it all away, but <laughs> anyhow. <laughs> but <laughs> so uh, our office is in Cape Town, and Cape, uh, the, the site of our office is uh, as, as much the location as it is a vantage point. So we look at uh, the projects, the work, and uh, w whether we teach in Harvard, everywhere in a way from that vantage point. So inhabiting the physical and intellectual space of Cape Town confronts us with the discrepancies between an acquired self-definition and the actuality of our experiences. And if I talk about an acquired self-definition, I'm particularly talking about how we were taught at university. We are constantly reminded that our educational backgrounds and the concomitant imaginings of what kind of work an architect does are at odds with a sense of the task at hand and the expressive possibilities that our time offers. So architects love blaming their teachers, but there's something about time moves. And uh, your teachers may have compelled to educate you in a certain way, 
because of who they were and where they were. But as you grow older, of course, there's a gap that develops, and it's for you to make those adjustments. Now, it is not so easy to break yourself loose from your time and place. Um, one of my favorite books of all time is Edward Said's uh, a book called Culture and Imperialism, where he said that in his tracking of English and French literature of the 18th and 19th century, he found no dissent um, to the idea of imperial expansion, occupation of foreign territories, or theories of black inferiority. Now, it's a lot of writers he's talking about. He's talking about two centuries of people uh, in England and in France, in English and in French, and he's saying he finds no dissent to this idea. So today we find it so obvious, but at that time, what Edward Said said is he could find no evidence that anybody thought outside of it. It's my conclusion, it's not so easy to break yourself loose from your time and place, although you may want to. So it is naive to think that it's easy to escape the epistemologies of your time. The idea of the cultural practitioner as a disruptor is well celebrated, but creative work sits in a tension between habitual practices and creativity, which as uh, I spoke about earlier. So how do we then cut ourselves loose from the worldview that we are educated in? and the constructed images for us of our future selves, so the image that our teachers constructed in us of our future selves. Um, so two practices come to mind. Uh, firstly, we believe that we have to begin to engage in exercises that disrupt our certainty. Good oh, evening. <laughs> Sowing confusion tills the soil of the mind. A commitment to unlearning the certainties and the bad habits of the past is as much about establishing authentic ideas and aspirations as it is about creating truly original motives for future work. Um, the purpose of tilling the soil is not breaking the earth. It is preparatory work for the growth of a new season. So confusion has that sense of tilling the soil. Our working methods are, much about, are as much about creating new understandings as they are about sowing confusion about what we know as a precursor for knowing it differently. And remember, this is a thing you do to yourself. You confuse yourself. Um, our work involves a great deal of unlearning as a confrontation with the epistemological basis of our knowing and our actions. The pursuit of confusion can take on many forms. At the most basic level, we refuse to use certain words. We have things like the S word, the I word, the D word, and so on, referring to sustainability, informality, decolonization, and so on. So uh, besides being polysemous, we find that these terms can allow a laziness which forecloses our engagement with the issues at hand. The avoidance of easy comprehension might at times be confusing to others, but the practice of using authentic language is the basis of new understandings and original motives and design. So any one of our students would know is that somebody says they're designing a courtyard, and I said, could you just stop using that word? Could you describe it in another way? I always think, well, what's the problem with you? It's courtyard's easy enough. So, but if you had to describe that in other language, what would you call it? And that for us is generative, to think, well, parallel descriptions of a thing that you think you know very well. Um, at a more complex level, we work hard to confuse established understanding of things, like the city, for instance. Um, So one of the exercises that took me 10 years to confuse myself thoroughly with is a, a study that we call Ways of Living, um, where we studied the spatial economic practices of people living in Cape Town with no or very little income. 
by using conventional real estate economic analysis and reporting, we showed that property on the periphery of Cape Town performed economically as well as uh, property at popular beaches. The insights are as confusing as they are generative. Uh, what we did in the study is to measure up buildings, draw their plans to understand how they work, to understand the sizes of space, to understand how houses work as complex mechanisms, as taverns, as, as daycare centers, um, as places for income, to understand how infrastructures, be they cul de sacs or taxi ranks or containers and so on, act as social infrastructure and as economic infrastructure and so on. Um, in essence, we're trying to understand ideas that pre-exist in our city that we are not necessarily the authors of. And then in working on this work, we collaborated with a photographer called Masitole Feni, who helped us document what we knew and saw and so on, but to document it through his eyes and through his ways of seeing it. Everything from daycare to socialization in backyards to um, entrepreneurial activity. And this process of learning about the city that we are in, we are living in the city, but I can tell you it's amazing how little you can know about where you're living. Um, and to begin to unlearn our certainties about how socialization works, how socialization works for a whole lot of people and so on, then let very powerfully as a generative influence in the design of a building like this, for instance. Uh, uh, building for entrepreneurship development with the market and all sorts of things uh, in a very popular area of Cape Town. Um, but this process of learning and unlearning and confusing has to do with beginning to establish an authentic basis for future action. Um, so the second practice that I want, so the first practice, this practice of sowing confusion. The second practice is a commitment to description. I think it's, if you want to understand one of the things that Eels and I are most committed to in our academic work in, in our meditations is description. I mean, Eels has this photograph um, of Katrina Majit that I think you've been staring at for about 10 years. It's up in the office and we keep on finding things in the same image. We encourage people around us, students, co-workers and so on, to stare at images to see what can we find anew. So uh, this commitment to describing is a very important part of it. We can develop new perspectives and understandings by a disciplined and a non-disciplined description. To learn to describe, to practice description as a probing gaze are exercises which expand the possibilities of what we are working with. Describing what has evaded description is generative in design, teaching, and research, and it is also political. You cannot criticize what you cannot describe. We recently uh, tried to describe the deliberate escalation of inequity in our society through a project that we call the crime of our time, uh, referring to the idea that apartheid was described as a crime against humanity and that inequity in our society has escalated substantially since the end of apartheid, which certainly must be the crime of our time. Um, this project was a self-initiated, self-funded exploration that later became the basis of public discourse. The drawings and writing explored how the city uh, design supports predatory capitalism in order to monopolize economic opportunity. Uh, in parts of the, uh, so it monopolizes economic opportunity in certain parts of the city and then desaturates economic opportunity out of other parts of the city. So we developed a visual lexicon uh, that visualizes this phenomenon. Um, so the tradition of architectural drawings and urban design drawings have this habit of showing doors open in a plan, streets as accessible and public and yet we know doors can be shut and locked, and a street can divide as much as it can connect. So we said, what if we redraw Cape Town 
and we take something like a highway, if the highway c disconnects, we draw it as black as opposed to white and open. If something is open in public, we make it white. But if it disconnects, we make it black and we just wipe it out of the plan, like a door that is shut, that you cannot see what is beyond. Um, so what we did is we showed what is owned by the city in white and what is publicly accessible. We showed anything that is a barrier of some sort in black. And then we showed each one of the properties as a multicolored entity to show the plethora of ownership. So this is a piece of urban design dating from the 1930s, just before Grand Apartheid started. But it already has all the precursors of apartheid. It takes the neighborhood planning of Lewis Mumford, but it racialized it, and it added buffer zones to it. A North American thing. We were not the inventors of that. Um, but you can see there an island of space in the middle of the plan. To the top left, you see what was uh, racialized as a white neighborhood. Uh, at the very top, you see an industrial area. On the right, you see what is racialized, what uh, was called in South Africa colored, which meant uh, different from what it means in the United States. It refers to mixed race. So you can see how this sits as an uh, island of space. And you can see that there are four points of entry into this island of space. There were three during apartheid. And you can imagine how social unrest can be controlled at these points, and it's no surprise that there were military encampments at the entrance to this neighborhood. It's a very purposeful bit of design. What is maybe far more surprising is that this spatial planning was labeled a crime against humanity. But during the post apartheid era, this neighborhood, this is a place called Century City, a place uh, with shopping malls, hotels, office buildings, and so on uses exactly the same spatial pattern. So we made it red and pink, but it's owned by one owner. It's the size of the city of Cape Town. And in, in uh, area, but also in terms of its um, rights for residential, commercial, and retail space. And it has four entrances for control of another sort and so on. So I, we can go on about this. This is a long project. We also drew the city of Cape Town in the same manner. It shows the colonial city, and you can see the control of the harbor by one entity, the waterfront by another entity. But forget about the detail of this. These are drawings made to try and describe the city that we are in. This assumption that we do not know the city that we're living in, and a commitment to description that is our way, in a way, out of that. The, another form of description that we treasure very much is the act of making um, through drawing, collage, model building, etc., etc., a variety of ways of making it. The intentions of the mind are executed by the hand, but these executions never match those intentions precisely. So we still draw by hand. I draw on a drawing board and I draw digitally, but we treasure very much the discrepancy between the hand and the eye. Let me elaborate on that. We have to train our eyes to describe what we actually made rather than checking conformance with the original intentions. The capacity to imagine differently is not just a function of the imaginative mind, it is equally the cultivated capacity to observe, describe, and value the mismatch between actions and intentions. We're not talking about other people's actions and my intentions. I'm talking about my actions and my intentions. I'm looking for the mismatch between those things. Why would I? Why would I try and describe it with accuracy? This practice imagined a dismembered body where my eyes and my legs and my feet are separate from each other as if they are owned and controlled in different centers. We have to develop a hand that can draw what the mind did not think, and an eye that can see what the hand did not produce. If judgment is all that we project onto our handwork, we miss out on the opportunities presented by reading and description. If the work of our hands are only seen through the judgment of the mind, we are missing out 
on the pleasures that the eye can find. The imprecision of drawing by hand on paper and the immediacy of a collage and cutting as a method of exploring uh, a form are excellent mediums to produce the gap between intention and execution. Uh, the design of the African Mobilities Exhibition that Ilza showed a, a moment ago uh, involved making assemblages out of cut and folded paper stuck together in layers. These assemblages were appreciated as things in themselves, as a process of reading and describing their pleasures and effects, um, uh, which formed the basis for making. Okay. Um, I can maybe just say, I hope that that uh, fits in here, is that you will find that on our website and in the publications that we have in the office, you know, we keep on representing exactly the same thing through a variety of mediums. I'm just going to flip through this very quickly. You'll see we draw with ink on paper. Then we draw with pencil on paper the same thing, and we repeat these things with ink and paper, and we draw the tiles and we draw the little things. Then we make renderings, traditional manners, um, that reveal uh, things in certain ways. Then we redraw. Uh, the, uh, you can find ink sections of this black line, white paper. Then we draw them as lino cuts. And we make drawings like this. You would say, well, what is wrong with these people? When are they going to end? Are they independently wealthy? They, do they have nothing to do? Or what is going on with them? But there is a sense that if we redraw and remake and re-see and so on, something else will emerge. If we are practiced in describing and seeing our work as if it's the first time that we will ever see it, it's important. So to draw the temple in a classic architectural manner or to draw it in a rainstorm there's a sense that maybe we'll think of the thing differently. We will think through every part of it and whether we're doing it properly. We can draw the dome like this. We can see it like this. We can make it through a variety of printed matter, all sorts of matters, all ways of just seeing this thing constantly differently. OK. Um, let me just see. Yeah, you. So. We've spoken a lot about working in the studio, drawing, thinking, looking at photographs, and um, and creating from there. But there's another element to our practice that deals with walking, um, walking with others, and walking and thinking. And there's a lot of, you know, it's it's a kind of an extension of the, you know, going to site and you know being um, on on the ter in the terrain. But for us, it's very much a politicized notion of walking, and. I'm going to share a story with you called Gaiety. Where is it now? My father, Wilfred Damon, grew up in a neighborhood in Stellenbosch where no one had much, yet everyone earned enough to keep things ticking. It was a neighborhood that was mixed and integrated in terms of religion and race, yet class determined certain aspects of your life and a matriarchal network economy presided over this creolized setting. Afrikaans was the dominant language spoken and a fluency in English signified class aspiration. Xhosa was spoken by a large majority of people, but this community were considered as outsiders to defluctor a group of people who identified as descendants of enslaved persons and as descendants of people from St. Helena, a remote island in the South Atlantic Ocean. The, mo the mosque was situated right next to the Anglican church, which was right next to the bioscope. He often went to this bioscope called the Gaiety Bioscope, which was literally across the road from where he grew up in his grandmother, Maro's February's house. The gaiety was a very important refuge for him, and I grew up with stories of him going to the bioscope to escape the cruel regime and the cruel situation that was forced upon him as a young black person living in South Africa in the 1950s and 60s. My father has written down his memories and going, of going to the gaiety bioscope, the cinema that once stood in Andrunga Street. 
one of on one of the um, conversations, he made this drawing of the plan of the bioscope. De Flakte was demolished between 1960 and 1970 as part of a Patriots project of separate development and forced removals of racialized people of color from the center of Stellenbosch, where I also grew up. Wilfred, my dad, recalls particularly two stories. The first is the earthquake of 1969, with a film that he was watching, a typical Hollywood flick of the late 1960s, was interrupted because of the effect of the tremor. At that moment, he writes, flight fantasy and reality was confused, because he wasn't sure if it was in a movie or why is the earth suddenly shaking, and tremors are definitely not a usual uh, phenomena in our part of the world. But patrons ran out of the cinema feeling as if stepping out of the cinema meant stepping inside a real life extraordinary drama of the earthquake and its after effects. The second story that my father Wilfred writes about concerns the Plaza Bioscope, the cinema that was designated for white patrons during apartheid. Back then, films would first be screened at the plaza, then a week or two later, the same films would be screened at the Gaiety, a cinema that was classified for people like my dad as non-European. He was thrilled to see that the opera La Bohème was advertised and therefore due to be screened at the Gaiety too. He had a little crush on Maria Callas. My generally law-abiding father, okay, sorry, however, he soon realized that those who were in control of choosing the film screenings had no intention of showing La Bohème at Gaiety. So, my generally law-abiding father, insulted and disappointed, decided to break the law and planned together with his, with his good friend, Leonard Biscombe, the projectionist at the plaza, to pretend to be, to be his assistant, and in that way was able to watch Puccini's famous opera in relative peace. The legacy and brutality of forced removals have left deep scars in the fabric of the city. Narratives of trauma have dealt with the issues around dislocation, belonging, and return. Ideas about home is a key theme in many of these narratives. But how is imagery of the social imagination remembered and dwelled upon? Gaiety, um, we, we pr produced a publication called Gaiety that records the story and in three different languages, English, Afrikaans, and Xhosa. Um, we produced it as an analog style a magazine and um, what we then also did was um, we published the recollections of both events, the earthquake interrupted by the gaiety and the non-screening of La, La Bohème. The publication, the pa pamphlet or pamphlet was distributed at the event which, which was the screening of La, La Bohème projected on a white sheet on the site where the gaiety once stood nearly 50 years ago. The sound of the screening came from car audio systems loud enough to recall the mood of the earthquake. Through the audio and visual screening, we recalled the memory of the gaiety and dwelled on the emotions linked to the non-screening of the La Bohème at Gaiety and my father's act of watching it at the Slechts Blancas Plaza Cinema. Slechts Blancas meaning whites only. An hour before the screening, my father took a crowd of about 50 walkers. Some were his friends who lived in the neighborhood with him. Others were curious artist types who heard about the work um, because of the festival was a li live art festival. And then others were the merely there lending support. So he took everybody on a sunset tour of where the neighborhood once stood. My father, speaking in Afrikaans, reading partially from his short notes, made a point of naming everybody that used to live there, with some of them responding from the crowd in agreement and approval. Nicknames were included in the naming gesture, eliciting bursts of laughter at the recall of a man called Sam Binakop, which means Sam Bonehead, and Auntie, Aunt Auntie Kathy Failbart, which means Dirty Beard. Um, 
Disappointment, laughter, anxiety, resistance, rapture, nostalgia, loss, and trauma are the words that come to mind when I have to describe the emotions that were collectively felt during the intervention. That evening, I witnessed the coming together of a diverse group of people following a man in his late 60s, my father, through the empty spaces that was once his childhood neighborhood to the cinema to see a Parisian melodrama from a sheet hanging ghost-like from a building that is no longer there. But afterwards, a well-known Stellenbosch land artist approached me, thanked me for organizing this event because up to that day, he had never heard of the erasure of defluctor neighborhood before. These kinds of interventions stem from a residency that we did um, where we walked the landscape and walked through ruins and began to collectively form our perceptions and our politics of the space in and around Cape Town. Um, it's a kind of embedded knowledge production. It's a, it's a kind of a way of dis disrupting the normal kind of field work, the normal kind of site um, visit. Um, but it is to think about our, our city in these kind of very immer immersive and embedded ways and then producing knowledge through our own subjectivity around these sites. One of the other uh, ideas that Eels and I are exploring intensely and in a way through the work at Harvard at the moment is the idea of fragments. Um, so we had a discussion this afternoon with some of the students involved in a student publication. And they asked us, what do we do? And we said, oh, well, we design buildings, we write books, we build buildings, we make films, we do artistic interventions, we organize exhibitions, we teach, we, and it went on and on and on and on. Um, so in doing all of these things, we find ourselves to be generalists rather than specialists. Uh, as much as we admire specialists for what they do and we like collaborating with them, we find that meeting our aim of creating an architecture of consequence in our context we have found it to be just more useful to have a broad and collaborative approach um, uh, rather than being specialized. Uh, we don't believe in the idea of the genius author. You'll find is that we often criticize that. What we produce through conversation, what we understand through collaboration, what we gain from the particularities of circumstance have an authentic generative power that is far richer than the imaginings of a single author. And that is part of why we work with other people. We often locate generative narratives outside of ourselves. So that uh, ways of uh, living research, where we documented what other people are doing in Cape Town, was a way of being able to talk to people about ideas of shaping the city without us being the authors of it. It is much easier locating the authorship of an idea outside of yourself. Let me just explain this a little bit. The story does not always begin and end with us. We join the party after it started, and we often leave before it ends. Architectural expression must reconcile a situated response with the poetics of authorship. You see, the modernist tradition is that of the heroic genius author, you know, and the sort of star architects, Zah, Didrim, Quillas, so it's all that of the genius author. It's not necessarily situated and it does not necessarily, is not necessarily participatory. Considering the urgency required to affect social, political and, and economic change in South Africa, the capacity to imagine the full task is beyond the grasp of an, of an individual. To produce an architecture of consequence, our confrontation with new ideas and our effectiveness as practitioners, teachers, writers, and advocates is enhanced through the collaborations and diverse confrontations with situations that require action and reflection. The practice of confusion, the intermittent investigations of a generalist, 
and the diverse fragments of multiple inputs all tend to produce a multitude of fragments. Now, as stated above, our working method is aimed at breaking apart rather than gathering new pieces and making uh, uh, altogether new constructions. Now, we've been very much inspired by the work of an artist called Kader Atia, who's been thinking about this thing of breaking apart and what repair means of broken things. Now, uh, he did a whole lot of research on plastic surgery that was performed on victims uh, of uh, violence in the First World War, where people's faces were mended. It's really the his medical history of plastic surgery, where the attempt was, in essence, to restore faces back to their original condition. And then what he did is he took a whole lot of masks from Africa that had the identical damage to that mask, an eye missing mark in the mouth and so on. And he would show how the repair did something else. Instead of restoring the original image, it created a new image, a composite image, a richer image, the beginning of something new rather than a return to something of old. And he then points out how this sits in the tradition of uh, textile traditions like the Kuba cloth of the Congo and so on, where there is a pounding of it to make it nice and soft and when it gets damaged it's not seen as broken but it's the beginning of a new layer that is overlaid with it but it's a consequence of softening the material. This of course exists in other kinds of cultures, you know, in Japan where bowls are repaired with gold, etc, etc. But it has struck us is that we want to do something more than Kaderatia. So if the vessel of the colonial city is somewhat broken, we're not keen on repairing it. The idea of repair in that sense is one of possibly actually breaking it apart more and reconstitute, reconstituting it in maybe the manner of collage or something like that that begins to make an entirely new whole. So the relationship with fragments and making fragments. So, you know, the idea that you find fragments is always this somewhat teary-eyed lament about a brokenness. But there's a sense that uh, fragments don't always have to refer to the image of the damaged or the broken. In Homi Baba's uh, The Location of Culture, an image of cultural identification is sketched where the identity of a city or a person is always constituted as a multitude of fragments of affiliation and association. In working with the fragments, we treasure the correspondence and the overlaps in modes of affiliation and association, since this perspective helps us to avoid essentializations, nationalist positions, or uh, a lack of empathy, um, or solutions uh, which are narrowly defined by their locations or their clients. So this fragmentary um, conception, the idea of multiple outcomes of double projects and so on are all part of this thing of a multitude of pieces. Um, so I'm just going to skip in the interest of time, I'm just going to skip s some part of this. Um, There is something about working with fragments. Sorry, I've spoken uh, about this stuff. Um, there is something about working with fragments that, you know, it's, uh, you can say, oh, well, it's an artistic pursuit. You think of these fragments. You're thinking of reconstituting it into a new whole. Um, you have artist license to do what you want, right? We're arguing that something else happens. You know, in the world of architecture is that reconstituting pieces into a new whole is a creative act. So whether it's research or design, so one has to take responsibility for that new whole that you're creating. You can't just put it together and throw it out like the bones in the ground and read them for whatever they are. Not everything goes. So how do we take responsibility for the bigger whole? So one of the things that has, uh, has inspired us very much is uh, the work um, of uh, Katie Bowman and the Long Array Telescope. They tried to photograph a black hole. 
Now, it is impossible to photograph a black hole in, in some ways. One is because it's extremely far away. Two is because it has no substance. And two is it sucks everything up that comes its way. So in order to photograph a black hole, you've got to get it against a black background, and you've got to get energy fields to curve around it, et cetera, et cetera. It's a long story. They worked out this whole algorithm. But what they also worked out is how you can, with extremely little information, let's call it fragments of information, construct a bigger image. To make a long story short, they worked out that there's a, you need a radio telescope the size of our planet in order to see a black hole. So we don't have a radio telescope that size. But we happen to have a planet with radio telescopes on it that's turning. So if you sh do readings while this thing is turning, you're actually getting um, readings the size of the planet, except that they're little fragments. So you've got to choose a particularly clear night and, 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 and you put all of these fragments together. But the number of fragments are way smaller than the complexity of the whole. So what they did is they then wrote algorithms that tried to test whether the fragments have a correspondence with what is known about the whole. Again, it's a long story. You can go and research it. It led to this image. But they did, for instance, things like seeing, well, can they, with the fragments of information that they got of the black hole, can they make an elephant? It turned out they really couldn't. And so they kept on having a reciprocal relationship between fragments of information and a sense of the whole. And to make a long story short, there's something for us in working with fragments where we have to take responsibility in a way for um, uh, the pieces that we are working with. Um, I'm just slightly unsettled, just a moment. I've sort of lost my place. Mm. OK. Um, so uh, one of the ways in which we explore ideas is to explore them with students. It's one of the most wonderful things that uh, our profession allows us to do. Um, and uh, th there's a way in which ideas can be put out into the public domain. So this was a studio that we taught. Um, I was appointed as the Charles Correa Chair of Architecture. Sorry. And uh, uh, this was, forget about what the project was, but what we did is we displayed at Nicola Academy in Goa. Um, it was dealing with a fishing market in the edge of the Mondovi River. And it so happened the Nicola Academy had a, a mural dealing with the Mondovi River. And we made the model to fit with the mural. And uh, what was wonderful about it is the way in which the students did all the talking to the public. The model was really big. I could sit there peacefully on the side and never said a single word. And it got the students involved in a way in taking responsibility for their work and putting it out into the world. This is one of the exhibitions that we've done at the office. Where you can see is that uh, we're putting out these ideas up in our office as a way as a confrontation with um, the. Um, um, sorry, just give me a moment. Um, uh, 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 with the ideas. Okay. Um, one of the other exercises that we did, and this was teaching at Harvard during COVID, is that we uh, had students who were at home everywhere from Lima to China. And we got the university to send everyone VR glasses. We designed the um, classroom. And we managed to get everybody around a table, so to speak, where we could sit and talk. And these models were out there. Um, and we could. Uh, fly around these spaces, we could project ourselves down into them and see what they were about. Okay, I'm just going to, in conclusions, uh, say one thing, and that has to do with this idea of inhabiting the horror and finding joy. 
An immersive and situative practice of architecture demands a confrontation with the actuality of the world around us. As we live in our city, haunted by the presence of the voids, describing them and criticizing the creators, we could be overwhelmed by despair. Um, as Ashraf Jamal, a South African writer and cultural theorist, suggests, the challenge is to find ways to epistemically endure and reconfigure terror. Um, it might sound dramatic, but if you live in a society like ours, there is something about understanding that. Um, uh, Edgar Peterson summarized it in a different way. He said, we need to abandon our deeply embedded belief that our moral and ethical questions must be resolved on an axis of hope and despair. He said, we have to cultivate a sensibility to inhabit the horror as a first and necess necessary step to truly grasp the decisive, uh, 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 to truly grasp its decisive grasp over us, and then to find languages and registers with which to name and possibly displace it. So he's saying we must first inhabit the horror, then we must learn to describe it, and then potentially we can begin to displace it. The compulsion of an architect to displace the horror would be rendered useless if it were not for the, for, uh, w uh, if it have not, uh, sorry, if we have not cultivated sensibility to inhabit the horror and ways to describe it first. Equally, if we have any hope for an architecture to have consequence, we must understand that architecture uh, has negated things historically. Uh, Fred Moten, the uh, uh, American cultural theorist, poet, and scholar, uh, has suggested that uh, while confronting the truths about anti-blackness, you know, in whether it's here or in South Africa, its eradication requires a concurrent celebratory analysis of black blackness. In practicing architecture, our work follows very much this suggestion, is we practice architecture socially with others. We inhabit the horror. We share and advance ideas. And it is through others that we experience the joy and the consequences of our work. As a social project, we are participants in a much larger project which, involves, uh, uh, which evolves over many years. Our contributions are fragments in a process of repair. These fragments contribute to a, an incremental advancement of freedom and an expansion of our expressive lexicons. The aesthetics of our work are really driven by this, so the expansion of freedom on the one hand and expanding our expressive lexicon. Uh, and in conclusion, I would like to say is to make a political and artistic contribution, you have to take risks with what you do. The practice of sowing confusion, of repetitive investigations, of uh, simultane, uh, simulating exercises like the ones that we did at Harvard, uh, working through the relationship between fragments and the whole are methods of working aimed at being responsible while pushing the boundaries of architecture. We advance and accelerate the generative reciprocities between reflection and action through simultaneous engagement in teaching, writing, and research, and advocacy. That is what we try and do. Thank you very much.